Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. Uh, those of you listening on the podcast and watching the video, we are sitting here recording in uh, beautiful uh, Friday morning in beautiful Midtown Manhattan. And uh, the, this week's Dividend Cafe has, has a bit of a doozy. It's it's kind of a two parter, so I guess that makes the the it's the second part of a two parter. I guess that makes the two put together really a, a, a doozy. But I am. Um, I am kind of happy with this week's Dividend Cafe. I, for one thing, just got done writing it about 45 minutes ago and then walked straight from my apartment here to the office to record this. It's all kind of fresh in my mind and, and I've been working on writing it since uh, literally about 3.30 in the morning. And I believe that it captures, in a, in a number of different ways, the, um, the major theme uh, that is macroeconomic in our in our country right now, and that investors will contend with in the in the years ahead, and it and it sort of I'm striving with this topic to bring together, uh, synthesize a lot of different things that are happening at once because a lot of people talk to me about the national debt. Um, we talk a lot about how low interest rates are. We talk about the activity of the Fed. Uh, interventions into credit markets, interventions into asset prices, how it impacts real estate, how it impacts stocks. And, and all these things, um, we talk about the, the dollar and, and weakness or strength of, of the currency. So all of these things, I believe in specific context, sometimes come to me as questions that are kind of individual or independent of one another. And yet all of them are very much interconnected. And that's sort of my job as an investment strategist to bring these things together and apply them in a way that is sensible and coherent and opportunistic for our clients. And yet, it, it requires certain um, understandings, certain uh, presuppositions about um, basic economics that, that not everyone shares. And, and so it is by no means an easy or simple task, and yet I've, I've tried my best in this week's Dividend Cafe, I'm gonna share with you now, um, to basically our approach to, to how we got here and, and, and where we uh, go going forward. One of, one of the, the major issues that the economy faces that it, it can be articulated like this, um, no one denies that, that we have a lot of ingenuity in America. We have uh, an American population that is uh, mostly very willing and eager to work and work productively, not entirely, unfortunately. Um, but we, we don't lack for a population that is able to produce. And we're, we're not um, an overly aging population. We're not an... Uh, an overly feeble population. We're not an undereducated population yet, and so there's there's a lot of um, ability in our in our uh, production capacity as an economy, and and we most certainly are not a population that lacks for uh, desire to consume, and and we have a great appetite for for consumption. So, so in theory, the laws of economics are such that America is in a very healthy position because there is idea generation, there's innovation, there's invention, there's technology, there's education, there's immigration, there's diversity, there, there's just a lot of great things. And all of that is baked on top of what is, albeit imperfect, a really robust free enterprise system. Um, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, uh, America's founded on basic principles of freedom uh, that lend themselves to the achievement of prosperity and wealth creation. That's all the good stuff, okay? Um, but then what we have is uh, cyclical realities take place in economy where uh, there will be recessionary, recessions, uh, recessionary uh, events, contractionary activities in the economy, and um, since uh, the kind of mid part of the 20th century, the school of thought has been, well, then that's when the government step in and, and intervene to help soften the blow of those things. And a lot of it was kind of the, the byproduct of the Great Depression. Uh, that, that was such an incredibly severe period that we thought, hey, we, we can't let that kind of thing happen again. So what can government do? 
And there's different schools of thought that were prevalent in the middle 20th century. Keynesianism, uh, monetarism, and, 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 uh, and, and a kind of different context, classical economics, that, that all had different suggestions as to how we go about that. Well, it's very baked into the fabric of the country now that, that we're going to come in and try to do something. Okay? That, and so I'm not here to debate that point. I have opinions about it. I think there's things that we can do that are good. There's things we can do that are bad. There's things we shouldn't do that we do do. There's things we don't do that we should do. I have all that stuff, but that's just not what I'm here to talk about right now. What I'm here to talk about is the reality of the fact that in addition to interventions into the economy, such as the ones that we saw last year, uh, in the COVID moment, and in fact, just passed another uh, intervention, a $906 billion stimulus package a couple weeks ago. There's now a proposal out uh, from the new administration for another $1.9 trillion. So just from the COVID moment alone, um, let's assume for sake of argument that the new bill were to get passed, we would have passed three bills that represent put together over $5 trillion of additional spending stimulus relief. And, and again, for sake of argument, just assume some of that was really, really necessary, really good, legitimate. Maybe some of it was not. But my point being, that is the, the mentality that exists in the country to come intervene at points of um, slowdown, or points in the, in the COVID case uh, crisis. You know, there's extreme uh, things going on too. But then that is on top of the fact that we kind of permanently run deficits, that we have a uh, spending structure in the federal government that is in, in perpetual excess of its revenues. And some of that uh, came out of um, the Cold War, where there was a huge increase in defense spending. A lot of that then came down um, post-Cold War, and we were able to, for a very short period of time, actually balance the budget. But then we um, have an incredibly high transfer payments overhead in the country. What I mean by that is the combined amount that we spend and entitlements for Medicare, uh, health care, and Social Security, those three together equal over 50% of total federal government outlays. We have a fairly high amount of discretionary spending, and, and a lot of that I, I candidly admit I would not really agree with or approve of, but that is actually small ball in the grand scheme of things. And so is, by the way, the interest on our debt um, it, as a percentage of total outlays. So you have all these expenditures. Uh, they are not things that are done against the will of the people. They're done because of the will of the people. Uh, and we can sort of substantiate that by the fact that the politicians who vote for all this stuff have, are reelected. The politicians who vote for it or who did it. Okay, there's no, there's no you know, tyranny going on here. This is a representative form of government for good or for bad. All right? So then you take the uh, interventions of the economy that um, we feel are, are there to buffer slowdown. They cost a lot of money. And you take the perpetual state of spending more than we have, and even though it is not quite like the welfare state of much of democratic Europe, um, it is a, a, a social overhead that's very expensive. Obviously, there were wars that took place post 9 11. I mentioned Cold War spending back post World War II, up through the Reagan years. So, we've had various things, and, and a, a lot of people have opinions as to which ones of those expenditures we liked and which ones we didn't. But at the end of the day, we now have this belief that, uh, that is accurate, it's indisputable, that economic growth has slowed down in America post-financial crisis, and that the rate of growth is sub-trend, that we are in below-trend growth, not just coming out of a recession where we were used to really robust growth, um, but that it, coming out of the great financial crisis, we really didn't even get back up to trendline growth, let alone above trendline growth, sort of offset some of that. And by growth, I refer to real GDP growth, meaning net of inflation. So the nominal component is not even important, even net of inflation. Okay. So the debate exists as to what needs to be done about that. And along the way, um, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the country, their role in our economy, um, has been totally reconstituted uh, in my adult lifetime. Um, beginning in the late 90s, when I think there was more and more of a desire to see the central bank protect risk asset investors, but then throughout some of the, the significant crises um, of the new century, um, starting off which, with what was one of the biggest nothing burgers of a crisis of all time, but Greenspan using Y2K as a reason for a lot of Fed activity, 
in, in money supply and liquidity. But then, then after that with 9-11, a recession that ensued after the technology crash. And uh, then, of course, the great financial crisis in which um, entirely new facilities and new conventions were, were put into existence um, out of the central bank as a means of, of buffering a lot of the economic damage and, and, and trying to buffer the, um, the impact of what were zombie assets, so were dead assets. You had over leverage, and instead of just sort of the hangover effect, we tried to buffer that, and a lot of the things the Fed did were really effective. Uh, some of them have nasty side effects, but my point being, you know, most people would look at kind of how things have gone post-crisis and say, okay, well, so far it sort of seems to be working. And for my purposes right now, it's all fair enough. But what you have is a lot of questions that exist as to whether or not the actions of the fiscal side, the U.S. government, are um, going to generate the growth we need as an economy to get back to trendline growth, and whether or not the Federal Reserve interventions are potentially going to be inflationary. And, and the, along those two kind of different debates, the, uh, the fulcrum of which uh, on the fiscal side is what the good upside potential is out of those actions and what the bad could be or downside. And same on the monetary. There are two different um, axes that we have to look at. Uh, there's a lot of different opinions as to where uh, the inflation may come or the deflation, deflation may come, all these type of things. And I um, believe that one's opinions and the conclusions one draws around those, those two issues, all of which are impacted by debt levels, and, and all of which are impacted by uh, our economic now dependency on the Federal Reserve's interventions, um, that they will formulate a foundation that's very important into one's investment policy. And they're certainly very much at the, at the core of what we're doing with client capital. And, and so right now you will see a significant school of thought, and this is what I really devoted most of the Divin Cafe to today, to rebut that would suggest that the Fed's ramping up money supply and, and we face big inflation, that we're going to have bond yields go higher and you're going to get a lot of inflation and um, that, that, that's going to push prices higher um, and, and then, of course, put P.E. ratios lower on stocks um, and so forth and so on. And the presupposition behind it is that government spending is increasing and that's going to create a lot of economic growth and then the money supply is growing, and that's going to then, to put those two forces together, become inflationary. And I think that the entire argument's wrong. And I think the entire argument's wrong um, with a little bit of cheating on my part, because it's very clearly wrong by testimony history. And I allow, uh, I graciously allow for the idea that this time it could be different. And that's fine. But it most certainly has been the case for a long period of time that as our debt to GDP has gone higher, 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 and our money supply has gone higher, 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 that economic growth has not grown in tandem with, with that debt to GDP, and that inflation has not grown, a rate of inflation has not grown with the higher money supply. And we're not talking about over three years, um, although uh, we are, but that's not merely what we're talking about. And we're not talking about merely about post-GFC either. This goes beyond just the great financial crisis period we're talking about decades of this. And so I put, I put some charts in Dividend Cafe to try to help make the case of what we're looking at in terms of debt as a percentage of GDP and the diminishing return we get from that debt over time. And I, and I make the argument that that's an inevitability, that it becomes more and more unproductive debt over time. It could have an important social function. It could have a legitimate military function. There's other aspects besides just economics. But I'm just simply making the case that for good or for bad, the economics of this are that we have a growing percentage of non-productive debt that is compressing debt by definition. This isn't an argument I have to make. This is a tautology. It's, it's inherently true that what we are spending is money we are pulling into the present that is therefore not available into the future. So, so the easiest analogy to use uh, the, is one of uh, your own business or your own uh, household. You have a bonus coming in a year, and that's going to be adding money to your income, and it's going to be adding money to your balance sheet, 
and you spend the bonus now on a credit card to go buy new furniture, um, and then when you get the bonus, that growth you would have achieved, you don't achieve because the money was already pulled forward. It's pretty basic, pretty simple stuff. Now the huge caveat, and I'm not going down a rabbit trail here, this is an important um, caveat, is that of course there is such thing as productive debt. And when a business goes and borrows money at 5% to go buy a business that's gonna make them 20%, a high return on that capital, that is a productive use of debt. They're putting a little leverage on to get a, a growth of equity, a return on equity. The problem is even for a business, there's a diminishing return to it. There's not just infinite opportunity and infinite deployment of a uh, wise deployment of capital. And there's a diminishing return to how much can happen. And yet, as that return diminishes and the opportunity set diminishes and risk increases through each thing you're doing, the debt doesn't diminish. It's just there hurting your balance sheet and hurting your cash flows as you service the debt. Kind of corporate finance 101 stuff. But why is it any different with the United States government? Well, here's one thing that's different. I didn't know this, by the way, until about 4.15 this morning at the charts in Dividend Cafe. Our government is $27 trillion of debt and it brings in about $3.4 trillion of revenue, okay? So a little over eight times debt to revenue. The S&P 500, all the companies put together generate about $11.5 trillion of revenue and has about $5.5 trillion of debt. Uh, it's a lot of debt, by the way. It's a high level of debt within the market index. So they have two times revenue to debt in, corp in public equity. And the United States government has eight times debt to revenue, a 16 times differential between the two. And, and so that what you have now is this problem of, of opportunity being taken out of the economy through the excessive debt, which, which of course has to be paid for through taxation. Even when you borrow to pay for it, the borrowing is just simply borrowing against future growth, okay? So then you have back to that desire to come fix things with interventions in the economy, monetary or fiscal. You now have a bigger problem because the thing you've done to create, to, to solve the problem is exacerbating it and you get this pushing on a string effect and that's where we are right now and and so my argument is that we do not face a period of sustained inflation coming out of robust growth from all this government activity but in fact the japanification lesson we've seen from the only other developed country that has really gone through this for multiple decades and then now the European Union is kind of coming alongside with us in the same sort of dynamic. Um, we are in a better position in our ability to generate top line revenue than both our friends in Europe and our friends in Japan. But nevertheless, we still face a similar economic problem of distorted ratios. The debt to GDP, the debt to assets, the debt to income creation is, is astray and it, and it puts a slowdown on economic growth. And so some will come and say, are you predicting a depression? And I go, of course not. Look, Japan hasn't gone into depression. They just have been kind of floating along for about 30 years. No, no real, real growth. Not, that's not good. That's not the American way. Now, we've had growth since the financial crisis in our country, but we're all disappointed because it's been 1.5% to 2% real growth. And we're used to, you know, 3% real growth, 3 to 4% real growth, going back to World War II. And, and my view is that um, everything we're doing to solve for the low or no growth problem is creating more of a low and no growth problem. Okay, that's the pickle we're in. So what's it mean to investors? First of all, you have to understand this. Talk about inflation does not mean nothing inflates. This is one of the greatest economic fallacies I've ever encountered, that there's such thing as a price level. And there's just this aggregate blob of prices that all either go up inflation or down deflation together. Prices are applied to individual products and services based on individual supply demand characteristics. And I remember studying the myth of the price level about 30 years ago when I first began intently studying economics. And the analogy that um, stuck with me then, I didn't even golf back then, and I, for those of you who know me know I don't have time to golf now either, but um, back then I could still appreciate the analogy. The, uh, talking to a golfer about aggregate rain levels 
like, hey, throughout the year, there's this percentage of rain and this percentage of, of raindrops and, and, and so forth. It is completely meaningless to that golfer on that day in that city at that weekend tournament. And everyone knows that. So when I put a chart in showing housing prices are going up higher than the uh, consumer price level, we shouldn't be surprised by that because inflation works off of individual supply demand characteristics. And my argument is that some overall threat to, to higher prices that drives interest rates higher is not the great economic threat of our day. The great, econo the great economic threat of our day is that what they're doing is generating more money at lower rates that facilitates more borrowing that bids asset prices up, real estate, housing, stocks, etc., but doesn't generate wage growth, that doesn't generate organic economic growth, back to that GDP metric that we're trying to get. And so I don't, I have a lot of policy opinions on this stuff, but that's not what I'm sharing it with listeners to Dividend Cafe and let alone my own clients for. I'm sharing it because as investors, our relying on continuing growing valuations is dangerous because of the diminishing return and the ability of um, them to use market interventions effectively. Our de decision to try to ramp up our portfolio towards all inflationary biases is dangerous because all of these forces are working against such a thing. There, there will be cyclical inflations, there will be ad hoc inflations, but primarily what we see are asset prices that are currently being bid up and that will lead to distortions. And I do not want to invest my client's capital on trying to bank on a distortion working to our favor and then getting out in time, playing a bubble, things like that. That reinforces the need to this inflation-deflation debate and the realities of where we are with the monetary and fiscal side of the U.S. economy for fundamental investing that is free cash flow generative, that is based on real companies that are actually generating revenues as, with as much purchasing power and defensive characteristics as possible, sharing the um, growth of those free cash flows with, with you as shareholders. I think dividend growth becomes a imperfect and yet very sensible uh, defensive and offensive reality in these forces that are at play. And I'm trying to avoid, be, by be, the, the testimony history and the economic outlook, uh, extreme views that we go to, to you know, NASDAQ 200,000 or that we go to a Great Depression. The, the, neither of those things fit within the universe of reality. Okay, what we have in the universe of reality is low and slow growth that is exacerbated by the present policy environment that there is, at this point in time, no easy way out of whatsoever. And that, therefore, makes it incumbent upon me to recognize the capacity for distortions that could create bubbles and not get sucked into a bubble being unaware of the fact that I'm in a bubble and to do my very best to find sensible investments that are cash flow generative that I'm not playing a valuation increase, I'm playing a cash flow increase. I hope that makes sense. I gotta stop now. Um, read Dividend Cafe, some great charts. This is about the best I can do to try to take about five very complicated topics and bring them together. I really, really welcome all your questions and feedback, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to this week's Dividend Cafe. Have a great weekend.